thank you all for coming out to this meeting of the Barron County Historical Society. Uh, in, in thinking about today and uh, the weather we've been having while I was researching the archives for March that we'll have on the radio next month, this appeared 100 years ago, March the 1st, 1923 in the Glasgow Times. The headline is, Don't You Remember How Cold It Was Then? Forty years ago, this is 40 years from 1923, so February 28th, 1886, uh, to the day the thermometer registered 27 degrees below zero in Glasgow. It was the coldest day within the memories of the oldest citizens, and we have had nothing like it since. And we ain't hankering for it during our lifetime either. <laughs> On the 14th day of February, two weeks before the severe cold spell, flowers were in bloom in every yard in Glasgow. Those who remember that winter say, uh, the one we're having now is very similar <laughs> to the one we had in 1883. Uh, with its alternate days of rain, wind, sunshine, almost tropical heat, and Arctic cold. So, Maybe a century later. <laughs> Let's hope we don't have 27 below zero in March uh, here in Glasgow this time around. We are thrilled tonight to be able to uh, bring you all uh, Susan Lyons Hughes, who uh, I have known a long time. And, and I have to tell you my favorite Susan story, and she'll probably know what it is is uh, Susan and her husband, Nikki, who is here with us, are both reenactors. And uh, uh, during the time that she was working for the Kentucky Historical Society, I asked Susan to come and give a talk about period costumes. Because, you know, lots of people like to dress up. And uh, I happen to know that, that <laughs> she was a real stickler for doing it right. And, and using her terminology, as I recall, from the skin out. So if you're gonna dress up in those hoop skirts, you've got to have the proper undergarments and everything just right. So she was driving down, I believe, to Bowling Green in a state car wearing her hoop skirt and period costume and uh, got a lot of strange looks and questions at the toll booths on the Bluegrass Parkway. So uh, I always think of Susan as the only state employee I know who drives around in a hoop skirt and uh, mid-19th century clothing to uh, do all sorts of interesting things. In the Mustang, okay. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> we are uh, very fortunate that Susan and Nikki have uh, sort of retired to Franklin, Kentucky, so they're in our neck of the woods now. Um, and we're pleased that we can uh, utilize their expertise. Uh, Susan has been a scholar of 19th century history for more than 40 years. She's a graduate of Western Kentucky University. She retired as the executive director of the Jack Jewett House uh, Historic Site in Woodford County in 2020. She was the manager of museum and special programs at Shaker Village at Pleasant Hill from 1994 to 2014 and program manager for the Kentucky Junior Historical Society from 1978 to 1994. Susan was the founding editor of the Citizen's Companion, a magazine uh, uh, for Civil War civilian reenactors. She was the associate editor of Civil War Historian magazine, contributing writer for Camp Chase Gazette, and has had articles published in the register of the Kentucky Historical Society, Blue and Gray Magazine, North and South Magazine, and the Texas Historical Quarterly. And so tonight, uh, Susan has a, a fascinating topic that she's going to uh, inform us. A lot of things that uh, we may think we know and don't, uh, but uh, it, it's always entertaining, and I think you're going to enjoy her program on quilts. Mm -hmm. 
say this tonight, but as I was sitting here, it just occurred to me that mm, years ago, I was born in this fair city. Uh, I, today is my birthday, and I was born at the old T.J. Sampson Memorial Hospital, so it's nice to come home. I grew up in Bowling Green, uh, only spent a little time here, but this is the city of my birth. So. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about um, something that fascinated me and something that is still uh, rears its ugly head from time to time. <laughs> That's how I refer to it. I'll leave you to make your own judgment. Is the use of quilts as codes um, to help enslaved people escape on the Underground Railroad. Um, several, every couple of years uh, there will be something published about this or show up. Uh, now with the internet, of course, everything on the internet is true. Uh, the story that Quilts were used with certain blocks as signals to help enslaved African Americans escape. On the surface, it sounds pretty plausible. Uh, but a closer inspection of the story uh, shows us that the scholarship really doesn't hold up. The first claim for a quilt code um, was published, uh, presented, I guess, in 1989 in an exhibit of African American quilts, which claimed that quilts were used to send messages. Although none of the quilts used in that exhibit were dated to the antebellum period, and the curator provided no sources for the claim. But the first place it was published was a children's book, um, Sweet Clara and the Freedom Quilt in 1993. It's a children's book, came, it came out, and it told the story of a slave who made a quilt with a map of the area and used it to escape to freedom. But the big, um, uh, big published work that made this claim was a book that came out in 1992 called Hidden in Plain View. It was a collaboration of a woman named Jacqueline Tobin and Raymond Dobar. Jacqueline Tobin is a writer of women's history who met um, a woman named Ozella Williams um, in the Charleston market in downtown Charleston. Ozella Williams was a quilt seller and Williams told Tobin that her mother told her that specific block patterns and quilts had been used in connection with escaping to freedom. Tobin, of course, was fascinated by the story uh, and later called Williams to get more details, but Williams refused uh, to elaborate on that. Finally, Tobin uh, was intrigued by this and she contacted Raymond Dobard, an African-American art history professor and a quilt dealer, and to try to get him to convince Ozella Williams to tell more of the story. And after three years, Will Williams revealed the code to Tobin. This was um, a secret code. When Dobin told Dobart, his response was that, you found what we've all been hoping to find, and that's a real code. And the code uh, that Ozella Williams told um, to Jacqueline Tobin, and these are all, these all for those of you who are non-quilters, these are all names of quilt patterns. The monkey wrench turns the wagon wheel toward Canada on a bar, bear, bear's paw trail to the crossroads. Once they got to the crossroads, they dug a log cabin on the ground. Shoe Fly told them to dress up in cotton and satin bow ties, go to the cathedral church, get married, exchange double wedding rings, flying geese, stay on the drunkard's path, and follow the stars. And so each one of those is the name uh, of a quilt pattern. Um, the book was published in 1992, and immediately Raymond uh, Dobard went on Oprah, and you can just imagine what happened. It became an instant overnight truth, grave, you know, graven in stone, this is uh, the real story. Uh, because with Oprah, everything uh, you know, gets blown up and gains credibility. The popularity of quilting as a pastime made it especially popular with quilters who were looking for new patterns. The 1980s and 90s saw an explosion of interest in African Amer American quilting, and the increasing study of black history all came together to make this story seem incredibly credible. Um, and it was especially popular with teachers because quilts are very visual, they um, can be very hands-on for students, and many teachers took the fiction work Sweet Clara and treated it as a non-fiction book 
treated it as historical fact to teach students. Since Sweet Clara and Hidden in Plain View, there have been more than a dozen children's books that have been written and are very currently very popular, I'm told, uh, by librarians. In 2001, The Secret to Freedom won the Teacher's Choice Award. Under the Quilt of the Night was another book. And in 2004, was published The Patchwork Path, A Quilt Map to Freedom. By 2006, there were at least six different versions of the code out there in circulation. People had all sorts of interpretations, were making all sorts of different um, assertions for that code. And many of those assertions contra uh, contradicted one another. But not one single woman who ostensibly passed down the code to her descendants has been identified. And not one African American proponent of the code claims an ancestor who used the code to escape. So how does one go about proving or disproving um, such a claim? Here's an analogy. I, as you can tell from, from Sam's introduction, I've been very interested in the Civil War and have studied the Civil War extensively. I would like to prove that given the scarcity of yard goods at the end of the Civil War, that women in Richmond shortened their skirts to above the knees. How would I go about proving that? The first thing I'd do is look, at, look for photographs. The Civil War was the first war to be extensively photographed, and there are lots and lots of photographs in Richmond in the last uh, few months of the Civil War. I would look for first-hand accounts of women writing letters, journals, diaries, where they said, you know, I just can't get yard goods anymore, so I decided to cut my, short, my skirts short. I would look for fashion plates um, uh, showing women wearing these. Uh, the mid-19th century, there were a plethora of women's magazines that came out showing women in clothes, current fashions, where you know, we all always look for the current fashions. I would look for some of those to see if I could find uh, fashion plates showing women wearing short skirts. I would go to museums. I would look for actual artifacts. Um, dresses where the skirt had been cut short to be worn above the knee. I can't find any of those. I've never seen a photograph, a, uh, a first-hand account, an actual artifact, a fashion plate showing that women wore mini skirts. But I can't prove they didn't because there's just no way to prove that. It sounds like a credible assumption. The same situation exists for the use of quilts as a secret code to help enslaved people find their way to freedom. There are no quilts or other artifacts that have ever been identified as having been used to help slaves escape their slavery. There are no period accounts by slaves using quilts in an effort to escape. William Still interviewed hundreds of formerly enslaved people in 1872 for his history of the Underground Railroad, and there are no accounts in any of his uh, narrative. There are no accounts in the WPA slave narratives written in the 1930s. There are no first-hand accounts by white women, presumably the makers of at least some of these quilts, of their intentions to make quilts to help enslaved people escape nor are there first-hand accounts by African-American women either. There's no documentary evidence of any instructional materials presumably used to teach the code to enslaved people or to teach quilt makers how to make these quilts. And none of the various authors, curators, speakers, or other proponents of the quilt code has a personal oral tradition of an ancestor who used um, quilts to escape to freedom. And believe me, there is a voluminous history of quilts in this country. And no accounts whatsoever in that voluminous history of quilts in the last 150 years makes a claim for quilts being used to help enslaved people exist. In fact, the book Hidden in Plain View itself, on which, which really was the one that brought this to the, uh, to the public, um, has a lot of fallacies 
Uh, first, it's based solely on the recollections of one woman, Ozella McDaniel Williams, a quilt dealer in Charleston, as told over the course of several years to Jacqueline Tobin. Although Williams' family made a fortune lecturing, writing, and curating exhibits about a quilt code since Williams' death, Family members have admitted that they only found out about the quilt code once Hidden in Plain View was published. This was not an oral tradition learned at the knees of grandmothers or great-grandmothers. Hidden in Plain View has no footnotes, and its bibliography consists uh, almost entirely of secondary sources. And by contrast, I've provided you all with a, with a bibliography um, of the research that I did um, for this program. Hidden in Plain View cites a 1990 book called Stitched from the Soul as one of its sources. That book cites several quilts as being made by enslaved people, but the fabric in those quilts dates from the 1940s and 1950s. And of the quilts shown in Hidden in Plain View, almost all of them are misdated. Hidden in Plain View shows no illustrations of actual antebellum quilts, only 20th century. Uh, Hidden in Plain View claims that the quilt code was used by Ozella, Ozella Williams' family to escape from Charleston, South Carolina. Allegedly, they went along what was an unlikely route across the Appalachians through Kentucky and Ohio north to Cleveland or to Niagara Falls. In the book, it, there's two different um, destinations. Um, historians of the Underground Railroad agree that most enslaved people who escaped were from the border states of Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Virginia, and that many escaped, tra uh, escaped slaves traveled initially to large cities where they could escape notice in a much larger population. Most of the um, quilt blocks, now I am having to see this from a distance, so just give me, let me see where the mouse is. <coughs> Most of the quilt blocks that Hidden in Plain View um, use, um, the blocks themselves post date the Civil War. The monkey wrench was supposedly the first quilt displayed as a signal for any enslaved people who planned to escape. It was meant to gather their tools. Some proponents of the quilt code state that the monkey wrench tool was invented or made in Africa. The adjustable wrench was actually developed for use on carriage axles in England. And this pattern has also been known by several names, including Bear's Paw, and there are a number of variants um, on the um, pattern itself. This is, a, uh, this is a monkey wrench. <coughs> and this is a log cabin. The meaning of the log cabin uh, was a safe house, and the color of the center block had different meanings claimed for it. Barbara Brackman, who is, I guess, today's preeminent quilt historian, dates the earliest date-inscribed quilt of the log cabin pattern to 1869, although there, she says there are some that seem to have existed as early as 1863, but the Underground Railroad no longer functioned. Um, during the Civil War. One author says that the centers of signal log cabin quilts were black, which apparently meant both safe house and someone might die. But she provides no source for this information, and her other claims about quilts are unreliable. Under, uh, under the Quilt of the Night, a fictional account uh, by Johns Hopkins, really, truly, uh, uses a log cabin with a blue center to indicate safety. Another writer um, says that the quilt works like a traffic light. The quilt signified a safe house if the center was black, a yellow center meant caution, and a red center meant danger. Uh, other lecturers disagree, claiming a red center indicated a fire was burning and the home was safe to come into. The black center meant that the fire was out and danger was close and to keep moving. Raymond Dobart speculated black was really blue, but then points out that a log cabin quilt owned by Underground Railroad conductor William Still had a yellow center, 
So perhaps yellow was the safe house signal, since in Africa the color yellow is used to signify life. So all these people are coming up with different meanings. Um, and here's another blog um, on cabin quilt. The flying geese block follow the flying geese in, under the stars. There are at least five different patterns with this name. And my question when starting to research this is how would uh, an enslaved person who is trying to escape know one from the other? Um, regionality is much more of a determining factor of what patterns look like from one area to, to another. Um, one of the other um, Here are several variations on the flying geese. How would, how would you know which one meant what? Um, the tumbling blocks that you sometimes see in quilts uh, was supposedly the code name for Niagara Falls and that enslaved people were supposed to cross the Niagara River by swimming or in boats near the falls. That's kind of a dangerous thing to do. I wouldn't suggest that. Um, and period accounts of escaped slaves describe using a ferry at Youngstown, Ohio, below the falls. Double wedding rings were meant to symbolize slave chains or being free to marry. Um, and the question I have about that is, symbolize slave chains or being free to marry, but how does that help an enslaved person escape? Um, and besides that, the uh, idea of a double ring ceremony is a decidedly mid-20th century um, uh, pattern. Um, one lecturer claimed that Catholic churches hung wedding ring quilts from steeples to indicate that it was a safe house. I'm walking down the street and I see a quilt on the steeple of the Catholic Church. I'm just going to leave that because I don't have any explanation for that. Uh, another, another pattern that talked about uh, we're putting on satin dresses and bow ties to go get married. That's referring to the sunbonnet Sioux pattern. Uh, which goes by a lot of different names, Dutch ladies, colonial lady, southern belle. Um, but that the earliest uh, documented case of a sunbonnet Sioux pattern is 1911. Um, and it wasn't really a popular quilt pattern until the 1920s. The bear paw quilt um, pattern, uh, there are lots of different interpretations, mostly about how to find food and water. Follow the bear paw trail. I don't think I'd want to do that either. Uh, following a bear, a bear trail was not going to be safe, except that bears were largely, and the bear population had largely been decimated in the eastern half of the United States by the time um, of the, the mid-1850s. Um, the earliest known pattern of this type um, actually dates um, from 1890, well after the antebellum period. Um, and there are several variants. Which one would people know? Here again, different patterns. I could go on and on about these patterns, um, but the point is this. Most claims for a quilt code to help enslaved um, people escape and hidden in plain view in other books, lectures, museum exhibits are not based on historical documentation and can't be verified independently. But there are inherent problems with the idea of a code itself. The first is that we tend to think of Underground Railroad, capital U, capital R, 
as an official entity. It was not. It was a metaphor. Some books, including textbooks, treat it as an official name for a secret network that helped escaping slaves. It was actually coined first in the 1840s by abolitionists as a way to taunt slaveholders. Uh, they used the word railroad to emphasize how much more technologically advanced the northern states were um, over the southern states. And they used the word underground to mean concealed, not literally underground. It was not, the underground part was not meant literally. It was not a series of tunnels that people dug for enslaved people to hide in. It was a metaphor. In the same way that the 1960s, we used the term weather underground. It became capital W, capital U, and for us, the Underground Railroad is capital U, capital R, but in reality, it's little u. Too many people today take those terms, those two words literally, and assume that people were building tunnels in which to hide enslaved people. That there was a furious effort to build tunnels all over the place, even in places where enslaved people were not escaping to. I have been told by a docent at a historic site in this part of the country, that historic site held people in bondage. I've been told by a docent at that site that they, the owners built a tunnel from the barn to the house to hide escaping slaves. Why would somebody who held people in bondage help other people escape? It's just not realistic. After the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 imposed even more harsh penalties on those who assisted enslaved people to run away, Publicity about such escapes and the open defiance of the federal law that such escapes represented was used to inflame the northern public. It was a part of growing rhetorical violence, a war of words. Frederick Douglass, after the Civil War was over, dismissed the Underground Railroad in terms of the larger fight against slavery as, quote, an attempt to bail out the ocean with a teaspoon. So another inherent problem with a code of that, such, that, of that sort, where was the Central Information Center, which told people what pattern meant what? Regionality is more of a determining factor of quilt patterns than political thought. As we've demonstrated, a bear paw in Kentucky is going to look different than a bear paw in Alabama. How does an enslaved person trying to escape to freedom figure out those distinctions? How was that code conveyed to enslaved people who did that and who conveyed that information to quilt makers? And then we've already talked about hanging quilts on fences, church steeples, etc. Isn't somebody going to notice if Mrs. Sanford Duncan or one of her servants keep on hanging quilts on the fence day after day after day? Uh, organized efforts to help enslaved people escape lasted 31 years. In all that time, wouldn't someone have figured out the code? If fugitive slaves could figure it out, surely somebody else can. Why aren't slave catchers figuring that out? And slave catching became a very um, important, if not uh, socially acceptable, occupation, especially with the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. In one interpretation of a quilt code, the fugitive was supposed to look for a house with a quilt flung on the roof. If you don't see the quilt, hide in the woods until it appears. In other words, you're supposed to find a particular house by a sign that isn't there. And historical research shows that most enslaved people did not make elaborate plans to escape. Recent scholarship, books such as Rebels on the Plantation, Beyond the River, What This Cruel War Was Over, definitively demonstrate that for 90% of enslaved people, the decision to run away was a spur of the moment, opportunistic decision. There wasn't time to plan, there wasn't time to send word ahead so that quills could be set up ready to give directions. And another inherent problem with the code is Many people not familiar with the history of textiles assumed 
the quilts of this period were pieced together, quilt blocks were pieced together, um, and using leftover scraps of fabric, fabric and were made as a matter of economy. In fact, throughout the 18th and first half of the 19th century, quilts were a luxury item, available only to those with the funds. Fabric was expensive, and quilting was largely a decorative technique. Um, the uh, most quilts of that time period were applique. The first piece pattern doesn't appear uh, in a ladies, ma uh, ladies magazine until 1862. Especially in the South, with fewer textile mills than in the North, most textile production focused on woven goods, blankets, uh, coverlets, which are warmer than quilted bed covers, cheaper to produce, and get, could be produced much more quickly. Um, African American made quilts do not differ significantly from those made uh, by white women. Again, social class and regionality is more of a determiner of what style of quilt is being made. So how long does it take to make a quilt? <laughs> you hear that an Underground Railroad conductor is bringing uh, enslaved people escaping to your area. Do you have time to make the correct quilt? And the larger question this brings up is that of slavery. It's the central issue around which the Civil War revolved. And today, our, our society knows that slavery is wrong. We therefore tend to look at it through the filter of the late 20th and 21st century and assume that everyone in the mid-19th century must have been against slavery. And that simply was not the case. As people in the 21st century, we don't see the distinction between abolitionism and emancipationism. And I guarantee you there were a lot more emancipationists than there were abolitionists. Emancipationists wanted the end of slavery, but they knew it would happen, they believed it should happen gradually. They also believed it should happen with compensation to those who had paid money for the purchase of enslaved people. Abolitionists said, no, we want it ended now, and we'll use violence if we have to. Not compensated, we want it over now. We assume that everyone in the mid-19th century was really against slavery, and anxious to help enslaved people escape, and that just simply isn't the truth. It also assumes that women, uh, both white and African American, uh, were political activists in the issue of slavery. And while that is true for some <coughs> populations in some areas, it is not generally speaking true. We also overlook the legalities of helping enslaved people escape. And in particular, I'm going to be talking mostly about the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It wasn't enacted until 1850, but since the since 17th century America, laws and increasingly harsher laws uh, governing the apprehension of fugitive slaves had been enacted throughout America. Succeeding laws were stricter and stricter. And the Compromise of 1850 deliberately strengthened the penalties for helping enslaved people escape. The penalty for doing that was $1,000 and 10 years in prison. It is a federal felony. And it wasn't just if you helped an enslaved person escape. If you knew that an enslaved person was escaping and you did not assist in the apprehension of that person, you faced the same penalty. How many people are willing to risk a federal felony 10 years in prison, and I'm telling you that those penalties were enforced. In the Kentucky Penitentiary in 1860, approximately 10% of the inmates who were imprisoned there were for some form of assisting enslaved people to escape. One of those inmates wasn't released until 1869, five years after emancipation, and that's an indication of how seriously border states took the issue of helping enslaved people to escape. He was convicted in 1859. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. And by cracky, he served 
who's going to take that risk? How likely am I to help that to happen? A key component of all of the attempted compromises, beginning with the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the Kansas-Nebraska Act the Compromise of 1850, and the failed 1860 Compromise, all had as an essential component the strengthening of fugitive slave laws. That's what Southern lawmakers wanted in return for admitting free states to the Union. Uh, specifically, the 1850 uh, Compromise of 1850, the South accepted the admission of California as a free state in exchange for a much stronger fugitive slave act. Northern states responded with personal liberty laws, and these were designed to protect uh, those who formerly enslaved if they made it to a free state. Pennsylvania and Ohio were the chief destination for many runaways, and both states passed personal liberty laws as a way of tacitly encouraging enslaved people to run away. There were a number of slave codes that the South, Southern states uh, set up a legal system which limited the movement and commerce of enslaved people, and these clothes were um, strengthened increasingly throughout the 1840s and 1850s. And as I mentioned earlier, it gave legality to slave catchers, people uh, who made it their job to um, run down enslaved people, formerly enslaved people, and catch them and return them to their owners. Um, the F Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 enjoined all citizens to as assist slave catchers in apprehending fugitives. And the populace knew there were rewards for the return of slaves. The numerous uh, newspaper advertisements uh, in, in period publications of the day made sure that everybody knew that this person had run away. In 1858, a Frankfort, Kentucky citizen sued the Louisville and Lexington Railroad when an enslaved uh, woman that he owned was allowed to board the train without an appropriate pass. Uh, the enslaved woman used the railroad trip to Louisville as the first step to escaping slavery, and the railroad was found liable for assisting in the escape of the slave. And many enslaved people uh, escaped by bluffing it out. Thornton and Ruth, Ruthie Blackburn, who became among the most celebrated escapees on the Underground Railroad, boarded a ferry wearing their finest clothes and carrying a set of forged manumission papers and posing as free people. The reality is, is that slavery applied to everyone. Slaveholders, non-slaveholders were all responsible for slavery. Everyone in the country bore some responsibility. There was no getting away from it. If you wore cotton, you purchased that cotton chemise or dress or whatever, uh, it was uh, produced with cotton produced in the South by slaves. If you ate sugar, it was the product of slave labor in Louisiana and the Caribbean. If you ate rice, that was the product of enslaved labor on the Carolina coast. If you used a rope or twine, and imagine how common that is, rope and twine came from the rope walks and hemp fields of right here, Kentucky and Tennessee and were the products of slave labor. If you rode blooded horses from Virginia, Kentucky, or Tennessee, those were the product of slave labor. How far removed did you have to be from slavery before you bore responsibility? I volunteer now at the uh, South Union Shaker Village, uh, and I'm very pleased to do that. And I'd like to share an account from that village um, the Shakers were against slavery, and at South Union as early as 1820, uh, they had white and black Shakers living together under the same roof and in every way equal. Um, but uh, Elder John Rankin of South Union wrote this letter to the uh, ministry, Central Ministry at Mount Lebanon in New York. He asked three questions. Shall money or property which has been obtained by the sale of Negro slaves be refused or accepted by the Church of Christ? If refused, how far removed from the sweat and blood of the slave must money or property be in order to render such money or property 
acceptable, acceptable to the church. Our sugar and coffee come directly from the toiling slave through his master and is acceptable, should money be equally so. And he posed this situation. There is a sister in this society of 25 years standing and 15 years in the church, which meant she was a covenant signed member, whose father in Tennessee, being the owner of some slaves, died intestate. By the laws of that state, made and provided, the court has to sell the property, slaves included. The proceeds of this sale brings, brings to the heirs $2,000 each. We have received for the heir, heir who is with us $1,600 and soon we'll have the balance. When question number one is answered, we will know what to do. In other words, could they accept the money that came from uh, the sale of the slaves? And as I'm sure you know, the Shakers held all property in common, so it was going to benefit every single member. And then to complicate the problem, Rankin wrote, if the slaves are brought to Kentucky, they cannot, by the laws here, be freed and be allowed to remain the slaves of Judith or those to whom they may sell or give them. So it was a sticky, sticky question. So why does this story of Quill Codes continue to capture the popular imagination? And I'm going to tell you, it, it shows up about every six months on the internet. Um, it's just, it's just there. Barbara Brackman, who's the uh, preeminent quilt historian, wrote, the tale of quilts in the Underground Railroad makes a good story, but not good quilt history. At the turn of the 21st century, Americans are eager to discuss black history. Quilts in the Underground Railroad are the perfect pair of bookends for chronicles of slavery. The story of black heroes risking their lives for freedom and white heroes risking their liberty to shelter escaping slaves has resounding appeal. Giles Wright, um, who was the director of the Afro-American History Program of the New, New Jersey Historical Society, the Historical Commission, and he wrote the book Steal Away, Steal Away, A Guide to the Underground Railroad in New Jersey. He told the Camden County Historical Society in 2001, the quilt code is sheer conjecture and speculation that greatly misrepresents black history. It is nonsense and a perfect example of what those of us who are attempting to do serious Underground Railroad research are up against. David Blight, who was director of Yale's Gilder Ler Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition, wrote in a letter, the reason your student cannot find primary material on quilting in the Underground Railroad is because in all likelihood there isn't any. This is myth of the softest kind that serves the needs of the present for people who prefer their history as lore and little else. Feeding this mythology in any way only supports lore and not any real learning except about how such myths take hold and persist. The Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati does not tell the story of quilts being used as codes to help enslave people escape. Um, the quilt code is an easy and affirming way for teachers to teach students about African American history. They're very visual, the quilts are visual. And there are several um, books at the at, at lower reading levels easily available for classrooms. And unfortunately, they're responsible for a lot of this myth. <clears throat> Although uh, Hidden Plain View has largely been discredited, the myth still persists. As I said earlier, there are probably 16 books have been published with some version of the code, as well as maps, history projects, and arts and crafts projects that reinforce children's belief in the quilt code. For a while, quilt shops, quilt teachers, quilt books have made big business out of selling patterns. Quilt in a Day pattern book um, used to promote um, codes uh, in these quilt patterns, but they have backed off of that. And they said that its goal was not necessarily to represent that quilts featuring these blocks were used extensively as communication tools or to rewrite black American history. And there are lots of spin-offs uh, of this. I've seen hook rug patterns uh, for use as quilts, um, codes for quilts. Um, I've seen stories of the uh, black jockeys, the concrete 
lawn jockeys that were so popular, uh, which were only really mass produced in the 1930s. People want there to be some meaning behind everything. And it does a disservice to those enslaved people who used their own ingenuity to escape, the people who helped them escape, to try to imagine that there had to be some artificial or uh, created means that people weren't smart enough to do it themselves. They knew which side of a tree moss grew on. They knew where the North Star was. And they made it their business to do it. By themselves, without a I will be delighted to entertain questions, <coughs> comments. Yes, I'm a quilter, only a novice. I got into it way too late in my life. Uh, but <laughs> uh, part of what interested me was this story. Questions? I yes, always wondered how in the world did they get that quilt done that fast? Exactly. Okay. Especially yeah. a double wedding ring. If you've ever done a double I, wedding I ring. I never tried to do one. No. <laughs> no. 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 I actually, when I first started quilting, I saw something and it says, do not try to do a double wedding ring if you are a beginning quilter. <laughs> <laughs> this will just make you quit quilting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even a block, and then if you have a block hanging on your clothesline, that's kind of like red flags, like yeah, you said. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Comments? Well, thank you again for inviting me today. It's nice to come back um, to Glasgow. I've been here to one other meeting here and intend to come back some more. But thank you all very much for having me. Susan Lyons Hughes makes you appreciate the work of historians who are very serious and have <coughs> research and help uh, us all to know the correct story. And we appreciate you for that. I've been asked to remind you that the museum is going to stay open for about 45 minutes for those who might like to look around, especially if you haven't been up to the third floor, if you're a frequent visitor, be sure and go up to the fascinating things that are on display now. And uh, we will uh, have a March meeting, uh, the fourth Thursday evening of, Mar uh, of March. And the subject that evening will be uh, local suffragists. We've not ever done much about suffragists, and you won't find them mentioned in our local history books. Too much, so that's going to be a fun program to uh, find out who these women were and what they were doing uh, in the effort to achieve the right to vote. So, thank you all for coming. Yeah. <laughs>